three, two, one. Hey, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Baseball Outside the Box. I want to thank everybody in the U.S. and around the world for joining us and continue to please share the show. You guys are doing a fantastic job. We're getting all over the world. And we just want to keep expanding, giving out some great stuff when it comes to baseball development. And don't forget, we're expanding in all phases of baseball. Um, we want to talk the game in general. So join us and we have a great show for you today. Let me tell you, I mean, we went from, uh, you know, to from uh, India, I guess where we're going now. We are heading to China, but we're heading actually all over Asia. And one of the best people in the game of baseball, who I was very lucky to get to know a long time ago when we were together as envoy coaches with USA Baseball, heading to Italy. What a trip, collegiate coaches. And I'm gonna introduce them in a second. So don't forget, go to baseballoutsidethebox.com for the audio ESPN. Thank you very much, Honolulu. You guys for hosting the show on your website and go there if you wanna to listen to the show, the audio part and, and we're obviously on all the social media networks. So check us out there. Hey, listen, we've got the general manager of baseball development for Asia at MLB, Rick Dell, 15 years in that position. He, as I mentioned, was an envoy coach. Hey, listen, also 27 years collegiate baseball coach in New Jersey um, as a head coach. I mean, talk about tremendous experience. He's been all over the world. Let's not even waste any time because um, we want to get the discussion going. Let me welcome my good friend, Rick Dell. What's up, buddy? Hey, Pete. How are you? And thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, well, I should have had you a long time ago, man. Um, talk about somebody who knows the game, not only from a development standpoint, but, you know, to be able to express how it is all over the world. Because, you know, sometimes we're, we may be in uh, one city, one state, you know, one area, and we only know that area, man. But you know the whole world. Um, you know the game and the game and how it goes in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, let, let's do this. Tell the audience. I think it'd be cool. Tell them, I mean, where you grew up a little bit, you know, baseball-wise, what you did as a player and how you got into coaching and all of a sudden you were a head coach at a very, I'm assuming 27 years, you're a head coach at a very young age. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I grew up in the Trenton area, New Jersey, Hamilton Township. And, uh, you know, I did everything that everybody else does, playing high school, American Legion, Babe Ruth, Little League, Little Lads. And I went off to college uh, and I got a degree in English. Uh, I played semi-professionally in Lenore, North Carolina for six years while I was in college and while I got out, after I got out. And after teaching English for three years, I decided to, uh, I just didn't see myself doing that for the next 40 years. So I went and got a graduate assistantship uh, right where I come from. At uh, that time, it was Trenton State College. Now it's the College of New Jersey. I got a business degree there and I was graduate assistant. And as the story goes, I was there a year and a half and the head coach left for a professional job. And I ended up becoming the head baseball coach. And 27 years later, uh, Jim Small and, and MLB recruited me for the job that I have today in, in China. Uh, and that's how I got there. But as you mentioned earlier, it just didn't happen that easy. You, you do your work with the Envoy program in, in Italy and then you start going to Asia and doing envoy work. And you start doing things, I think, it's probably anybody who has had a career at the very beginning, they do things that probably doesn't really make sense on paper because they could be doing other more profitable things, but they're doing what they love. And, and many of times when you follow your passion, uh, it seems to work that, uh, that you, know, you end up being able to, to make a career out of it. And I was fortunate that I did. And I was fortunate that, uh, you know, Major League Baseball noticed that. Yeah, man, I'll tell you what, talk about, you hit the right spot, passion, passion for coaching, passion for working with players and kids. Um, and uh, I got to admit, when you said English, you know, you studied English, you teach English, uh, I'm in trouble. So with three languages, I screwed up. So bear with me during this time, because you're going to hear some words or some comments you may, may not have heard before or some grammar issues, let's put it that way. Hey, what was it like? That first time, you know, as a coach, or maybe it was a, as a player, but I think it was a, as a coach that you went internationally, you know, what was the kind of the expectation? And then all of a sudden, wow, this isn't what I expected, or it is. And what, what were some of the interesting things that happened that first trip? Well, when I first went internationally, actually, I went with you. You were on that program uh, yep. that USA Baseball had sponsored, uh, and we went to Italy. 
And uh, fortunately, it was Italy because my father's from Rome, my mother's from Lago di Garda. Actually, years later, I would get married in Rome. So at least it was to people that looked like me and uh, I could relate to. So that was a big help. And I had a passion for that. You know, this wasn't just about baseball to me. This was about going back to, to my roots, uh, which was, you know, just a coincidence. So uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, you have all of the, the transitions that you have just from, you know, learning how to order a Coca-Cola and a, you know, and, and a slice of pizza uh, becomes a, a, a challenge. But on the field, uh, you know, except for the language barrier at that time, I didn't speak a lot of Italian. On the field, you know, people are interested in what you had to do. So that was actually the easy part because people were locked into you. And so that was the fun part and the interesting part and the motivating part because you were working with youth, you were working with some professional players, and they were interested in what you were giving. Uh, you know, and, and then repeating that the next year we went back and, and then went back for a third year in Major League Baseball, came in on that program with USA mm -hmm. Baseball. And then Major League Baseball retained me after that, and I started to work in Asia. And I actually went to Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, and worked there. And the next year I went back, went to Jakarta, went to Singapore, went to Australia, and then did some, you know, went, every year seemed to get into a different country uh, as an envoy. And going to Asia was very difficult, especially in those days. It's not the same Asia that it is today. Uh, you know, I always had good people around me. But yeah, going to Asia was challenging, uh, not so much on the field, but off the field, you know, because it's different to negotiate going through Germany or, or Holland or, or Italy. But, you know, when you're trying to negotiate Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, you know, it can be, it can be a try, you know, anywhere with the Chinese language, it can be very, very challenging. Yeah, and we're, we're going to talk more about that because I think that's very interesting. You know, and the other thing, thing that's interesting is you got married in Rome. I got engaged in Rome. So, wow, that's, there's something there. Um, what about on the field? What, you know, you talk about on the field. You get there, and I remember, you know, even in Italy, you, you know, a lot of times, and, and you being 27 years a college baseball coach, you expect certain things when you show up, right, that players are going to work on, whether it be a team or even a camp. Um, what are some of the things maybe that you had to make adjustments on? Because everybody thinks, oh, I'll go over there and we're going to run it my way um, and I'm going to teach them everything. But I know I've learned stuff from them, too. Yeah, no, you're right. And I'll tell you, being a college coach, you are kind of the king of your domain. If you're a college yeah. coach for 27 years, I mean, the, 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 nothing happens unless you make it happen. And it's uh, so you're used to having everything perfectly in order. And I remember going to Sant'Arcangelo, uh, which was a great place right outside of Rimini, and working in the bullpen. And the bullpen was simply a four by six piece of wood hammered into the ground. So now you're trying to teach balance and you're trying to teach, you know, a wind up and a delivery. And you're using a, you know, a, a two by six uh, piece of wood to push off of. So little things like that, you know, and of course the mounds aren't groomed uh, in, in the same way that they are here. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the infield mixes aren't the same. Uh, so you're making adjustments to those because that has an effect on how you play the game. Yeah, you mentioned also Asia. I mean, look at all the places you've been, Indonesia, Singapore, Australia, and so on. Um, some of the differences now compared to them at that time, you know, what were the differences when it comes to, the baseball part, or, you know, and you mentioned some off the field things. Yeah. Uh, you know, baseball MLB has become more popular and that's helped. Uh, and places like the Philippines, places like Thailand have been involved now in the world baseball classic. There's more field development. There's more professional field development. You know, years ago, you were many times playing on a softball field because softball mm -hmm. were in Southeast Asia. So you're playing on a softball field. There's no bullpens. You're always teaching pitching on flat ground. Uh, there's no batting cages, so it's very difficult to get a lot of repetitions in and work on things, uh, you know, soft toss and tee work. There's not a lot of screens and cages. So you're constantly trying to improvise. And, and that's actually a, a good point. You know, when somebody brings you in to do a clinic and you're in Indonesia or you're in Thailand or you're in 
uh, possibly the Philippines or, or another country that doesn't have the baseball culture you have in some other places. You come in with this vision of how you're going to set up your clinic, and then you find out that there are no soft toss nets. There's no L screen. Uh, there's no bullpen, and there's no batting cage. And now you've got 60 people and you, and you're going to break them up into groups. But everything that you were thinking about doing is virtually impossible. So now you're going into getting wiffle balls and plastic balls and, and, and hitting, you know, badminton birdies, you know, at soft toss because you need everything with restricted flight. And you're trying to teach a swing, but you're no longer hitting baseballs. You're hitting badminton birdies. I actually got that off the soft, the national softball team in the Philippines was doing that. Uh, yeah, because you can't hit the ball anywhere. There's, you know, there's, there's no, there's no, there are no nettings. So, yeah, that really uh, impedes on what you have in your mind in terms of running a, a clinic. And you're yeah, all yeah, go ahead. overmatched. You know, internationally, when you go into a place, people get excited because there's an international coach or mm -hmm. they're interested in seeing. So. You know, they're not giving you a very intimate number of 20 people. They're trying to supersize that to 60. And uh, that always makes it very challenging. Yeah, and that's what I love about international baseball, because, you know, one, we could always pick something up. Two, you got to be innovative. You got to adjust. You know, you got to go on the go sometimes. You got to make different moves because, like you said, they don't have a lot of stuff. And some places do, obviously. You know, what was it like um, in some of these areas, you know, MLB is obviously strong into China. You spent a long time, you know, a long time in China doing a lot of great work there. Explain how the setup, how it's kind of set up and what MLB is trying to do in Asia. Well, well let's talk about China uh, because that's one of our big targets. And we've had a stake in the ground for 15 years. And, and uh, you know, I was there when we opened the office in 2007. Uh, we've done a lot of grassroots uh, level work uh, and we do a lot of, of course, now with social media, we're really killing it with a lot of the, uh, the programs that we have. But probably one of the biggest things that we've done is the development centers. And we've built three development centers, one in Wuxi, one in Changzhou, and one in Nanjing, 2009, 2011, and 2014. So we've had them now for 12, 13, 14 years. Wow. The idea was to create the student athlete concept where you'd have a year round baseball academy where the players are student athletes and they would train year round with the intention that upon graduation, they would get signed to a professional baseball contract, preferably with MLB or, and, or go on to college or a university to continue their academic and their baseball careers. And remember that it takes six years to get your first graduating class there. So even though you start in 2009, you're not going to get a major league or a pro player in 2011. That kid's only in the ninth, you know, because you're, you're recruiting 13-year-olders and, and bringing them all the way through when you're building. Mm -hmm. So in the last seven years now, we've had 114 graduates. <clears throat> wow. Uh, 65 of them have gone on to universities in China and the United States. Uh, we've had 31 that have gone on signed professional baseball contracts. Uh, and some of these athletes have done both. They go to college and they play professionally. We've had 34 players play on various levels for Team China. Uh, and I think right now we have 11 players playing college baseball in the United States. I think one of the more interesting statistics is that in the last two years, despite COVID-19, we've had 18 players offer baseball scholarships to play colleges in the United States. Wow. So that student athlete concept works. And you know, one of the challenges that we had early on was bringing that concept into an environment where it didn't really exist. Mm. Academic people say, well, that's, that's probably not gonna work because you know, how are you going to be able to go to college if you don't study all day? And then the baseball people or sports people saying, well, how are you going to be good enough to play if you don't practice all day? Well, as you know, we've done that in the States now for a century and there's a balance to it. And that's worked out handsomely for us. How does there the are, language work? I'm sorry? Well, how does the language work? They've got to learn English. A lot of them may not speak English, right? Most certainly. And English is a big part because if you're going to continue your career internationally, 
uh, in a in a in a uh, Western environment, uh, and even sometimes in an Eastern environment, because uh, uh, English is often the common ground uh, in many uh, international uh, situations. Uh, English is going to be important. So all of our staff, uh, whether domestic or international, uh, all, all speak English, maybe not as a first language, but they do speak English. How about the players that you're training? Um, they're in China now. They're going to go on the colleges, you know, pro ball. I mean, they've got to study English. Does that start in the schools there? Do you guys implement that as a program uh, yeah. during the academies? Yes, yeah, so we the, we have it in there. They mainstream into the academics of the host institution. So they're in a regular high school. Mm -hmm. And and that's part of the plan. Uh, and of course, they learn English there. But we also have TOEFL training, uh, Duolingo. We have other programs that we put them through uh, to accelerate their ability. The other three things about the programs are one, there are three elements. And they're very important. One is academics. You need strong academics. Number two is baseball. And that's the easy part. But mm -hmm. number three is social cultural development. And that is exposing your student athletes to various cultures, having them travel to other countries, play in other baseball cultures, to go to Australia, to go to the United States, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, to get out and experience other areas in life. And we find that to be the secret ingredient that accelerates their growth. So many of the athletes that I talk about now playing baseball in the United States, either professionally uh, or at universities, have had numerous uh, of these international social cultural development uh, experiences, which accelerates their baseball because they're playing against other baseball teams from the United States or they're playing in Europe, they're playing in Australia, or they're playing locally in Japan, Taiwan, and Korea, which are very, very strong. Uh, and then they're having, they're living with host families. They're getting a chance to learn not how to survive in another environment, but how to thrive. And, uh, and even in the United States, you know, I, and, and I had 54 players sign professional contracts uh, from my college team over those 27 years. And even though they're all Americans, just like you and I, they struggled a little bit when they went away and played pro ball. And it wasn't because of language. It was just because they hadn't had many of those independent experiences being away from their familiar environment. So that's worked out very well for us. All right. That's awesome. I love those three points, boy. I mean, you guys really put, did your homework here. And I know you spent a lot of time in China. Folks, we're visiting with Rick Dell. General Manager of Baseball Development Asia with MLB, 15 years just in that position. But Rick's been around a long time and doing some great work. Um, Rick, look, you got obviously a lot of college contacts. MLB has a lot of college contacts. How does that process look when you're trying to place a player from China into a college? Yeah. You know, that's a really good question. And that was one that I asked many years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, your kids have to be ready for it. So in 2009 and 10, 11, 12, and 2013, they're not ready. They're not ready mentally, they're not ready academically, and they're not ready language-wise. And they're, they're not ready baseball-wise, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Your program matures and you keep giving them these accumulation of experiences, they start, to, they start to mature. And once you make a breakthrough with a few players, it's just like with signing with MLB. When Itchy Shoe signed with the Orioles, all of a sudden, another player signed with the Pirates and another player with the Red Sox and then three players with the Brewers, but you need that breakthrough. So that's what happened. Uh, our first couple of players that went over to the States and went to college, they didn't play baseball. They weren't ready for that, but they could do the academics. Mm. Now our kids are getting recruited. There's a lot of websites that you can get on. I don't want to name any right now, but there are websites you can get on and you can, uh, load on your, your videos and your, your, uh, uh, your profiles. And then what happens is you create history. So once you get a kid that's going to a junior college in, uh, you get a player that's going to your junior college in Arizona, or he's going to college in California, or he's going to college in, in Florida. Now you've got a track record that our players are being recruited by maybe this coach's competitor. 
So they start to realize that these players are going to go on and they're going to stick and they're going to contribute. So when that risk factor is take, taken away, our players become very, very attractive. Very we interesting. Things too that have helped. Uh, at my high school in New Jersey, which is a, a Catholic high school where I went uh, to school, uh, in, the three, in the three years prior to COVID, I had 12 of our student athletes go there and, uh, and actually audit classes for three weeks. Put them in a host family, you go to class, you figure it out. They got to wear a shirt and a tie and a sweater and do all the things that they've never done. And, but that gives them some insights. And when you look at the track record of those players that had those experiences, they're the kids that are signing pro contracts. They're the kids that are going on to other co- that are signing, getting scholarships for colleges. So you just well, got to keep feeding them those opportunities. Absolutely. Folks on Facebook, thanks for, I know I've got some questions. I'm going to get to them. Ben Erickson, I'm going to get you a question. Hang tight. Um, you know, the question I, I, I'd like to ask, and I'm lucky because I've been to Asia a lot, um, but our audience, you know, just to give them a perspective here, what kind, when we're talking about Chinese athletes, um, from a mental standpoint, physical standpoint, what impresses you, you know, and what areas do they need a little bit more work on? And it could be common for a lot of players around the world. Yeah. I think that one of the challenges that we had early on is Chinese trying to say that they didn't think they were fit to play the game that we're playing in the States or other places in the world. And I don't believe that. And I believe that we've proven that. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's about the type of training that you have and building for power and speed and all the other, uh, you know, types of things you do from pitchers and hitters. Nutrition plays a big part with that too. Uh, so I think that in the beginning, the mental part that look, there is a future for you. And just because you're a little, because you're thin, that might be an advantage because you have a, a you know, room to mature. Uh, and we find that our athletes really respond and we've got some nice size kids that are coming out of, of China. Now, uh, the athletes are getting bigger. They're getting taller. They're just like, they're just like me and you We're all bigger than our parents were, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what's happening to this next generation of, of Chinese athletes. And the next generation will be the same thing. Yeah. But I think initially, and, and then if you look around at their Asian cousins, the Koreans, the Japanese, and the Taiwanese, I mean, for many of the years that I've been in China, those three places, those three teams have been ranked in the top five in the world. So to say the kids in New Jersey aren't as good as the kids in Pennsylvania, when the kids in, you know, the kids in, it, it can't make the major leagues when kids in Pennsylvania, New York, and Delaware are playing in the major leagues, that would just be a fallacy. So it's the same thing with China. If you look around at your Asian cousins, they're all excelling. And, uh, and, and, and we're doing that now in China. Absolutely. And I've talked about it on the show many times. I love the Asian culture. I love the way they play the game, the way they train and all that. And listen, from one English teacher to another, Ben Erickson, a friend of mine here in Illinois, high school coach. Um, he teaches softball and baseball. Uh, he he asked one thing that players in the West can learn from players in Asia. I, I think that one of the things that they can learn is that the Asian player, the Chinese player, uh, is extremely respectful and extremely disciplined. So uh, what we don't have with our players, they don't get distracted. You know, I was a college coach for 27 years and I had, I was fortunate to have a lot of great players and a lot of really good student athletes. I just met with uh, the president and the director of development with the college of New Jersey today. I hadn't talked to them in 15 years and talked about, uh, you know, some things with, with the athletic program. And so I have so many kids that had played for me that have gone on to be doctors and lawyers and all those good things. But, you know, they have it. There's a lot more distractions uh, for an American player. And the, the Asian player, you know, he does what you ask him. He doesn't get distracted with things that are happening off the field so much. Uh, and he's there the next day and, and ready to go. So it's a little bit more disciplined. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's not like uh, you're in church, but it, it's, it's discipline. There's a little more focus. And there's always a lot of focus and respect for coaches. 
And Rick, you know, one of the things you, and you know this in the U S you know, coaching's changing a little bit. There's a lot more um, asking questions uh, to the players. There's a lot more players asking why we're doing this. You know, in the old days, it was a little different when I grew up, I know, you know, your coach told you what to do very similar in Asia. Is that, is that changed a little bit? Have you seen with coaches in Asia or is it still pretty much consistent what you're saying? I think with players in Asia, they don't, they don't question anything. They just do it. Yeah. But I'm, Gonna, I'm not going to degrade the idea of asking because a lot of times, you know, if somebody's asking you something, that means that they're engaged in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. so at the College of New Jersey, if I was teaching pitching and I was talking about mechanics and later on at an appropriate time, player said to me, coach, I understand what you're saying, but here's what I think. You know, at least you know that he's breaking down. He's engaged in the conversation, he's engaged in the learning. So I don't necessarily look at that as a negative. No, I'm with you, man. I think you're right. And the other part of that too, Rick, is, you know, I mean, I know it's happened to me many times all over the world. Somebody said, well, we do it this way. What do you think? You know, and all of a sudden I go, wow, that's a pretty good idea. You know, we don't know it all, right? Yeah. No, you learn a lot. And working internationally, uh, it's interesting people's take on, you know, techniques, uh, and not so much the strategy of the game, but the techniques of the game. Very interesting, their approach sometimes. So you can always pick something up you might take with you. What's interesting? Give, give us a couple things, or at least one thing that's interesting. I remember I was working a few years ago in Sri Lanka. I went there because I was invited by the U.S. Embassy, and I, worked, I met with the Sports Council. And the Japanese, the JICA program, uh, which is sort of like our Red Cross in the United States, I guess, or, or no, uh, not our Red Cross, the, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name of it now. But uh, it, it's like some of the programs that we have internationally, uh, they go in and they, they teach a lot of things, how to farm, you know, they go in and, and they help people socially. And, and because they're Japanese, the one thing they always teach is baseball. And the Japanese JICA, the program, uh, the Peace Corps is what I'm talking about. It's kind of their version of the Peace Corps. And they go in and they build a field in, in, in Sri Lanka, in, uh, in Colombo, which, you know, is pretty cool because there's, there's not even a real baseball field in all of India. So to have a real baseball field in Colombo right next to India is really neat. And they play a lot of international tournaments there. But there was a coach from JICA, and he had a drill that he was doing by putting a bamboo stick over somebody's shoulders and their arms this way, and then going through the motions as if you were throwing. Ah. It's pretty cool because of the rotation of the body and the extension that you got on the front side. Yes. Uh, you know, something you might take home with you and get a few bamboo or longer broom handles and try that with your players. I mean, I wouldn't do it every day but it might be an antidote for somebody who's having trouble finishing. So Absolutely. You, like that, you'll pick up uh, and uh, from people. And, and I picked that up from them. I thought it was pretty neat. I actually videoed it and sent it back to our staff. Absolutely. Awesome. Love that. And listen, Chris, Dunn, I'm going to get you a question. I'll tell you why, because it's similar to what I was going to ask next. Um, Chris Dunn's a, an avid listener, great guy, got baseball coach. You know, I was interested in this because First time introducing baseball in China, um, that cannot be easy. You know, you, you're introducing a new sport. It's an American sport. Um, and you've got to work with the Chinese Sports Ministry, the Olympic Committee, and Chris Dunn asked this too. Um, how was that? You know, you had to get in there and, and, and set all this up. That wasn't easy at the beginning. And I'm sure there were some roadblocks along the way. And he asks here, um, not only working with the Olympic Committee regarding developing these players, what type of relationships did you have with any with, with any of the, you know, the organizations? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. In a place like China, uh, it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Unlike the United States model, where if I wanted to do something in baseball here, I'd walk outside my house and go to the most <laughs> organization and start baseball. Yep. China, you need to go to the top to sell that program, to have permission to to work with the programs that are that are you know the lower level it, it's it's actually from you go from the top down not from the bottom up 
And, and of course, you get their blessing, you'll have the opportunity to work with, uh, with their students and, and with their athletes. Uh, but I believe that you've got to do what you say. And, and one thing that we've done very well is we, we've done what we said we were going to do. And the other thing is we have proven that we're in a long-term project. You know, China's culture is over 2,000 years old. And for 2,000 years, people have been going to China, telling them everything, and then leaving. Mm. And, uh, so you have to be sensitive to that. You know, when you come in with all your great ideas, you're not the first person that did that. So I think longevity and stability and doing the right thing and a good thing is, is what you need to do when you're working with these organizations. So it takes some time to demonstrate that. Yeah, and it's interesting. MLB has definitely stayed there and doing some great work. You know, I mean, I go back to, and I don't, you know, the Chinese have been very open. You're talking about the Beijing Olympics. Both you and I worked that. We're talking Padre, the Padre Dodger game. We were both there for that, and you were at a lot more events. I mean, so they've really been open, and now baseball, and I remember the first time in the Olympics, and this was interesting, the education of the fans, because, you know, there'd be a foul ball and they would be clapping, remember that? And so we had to educate the, you know, right? It's a new game to them. How, how's MLB continuing yeah. to do that part? I distinctively remember that. And I'm sure that a lot of those fans were prepped that look, yes. when the team hits the ball over the fence, it's a time <laughs> to cheer. So when somebody hits a foul ball back over the backstop, everybody yeah, was cheering. <laughs> um, but I'm sorry, Pete, tell, repeat your question. No, basically, you know, MLB continues to educate players, coaches. We're going to talk about the coaching part, but I, but what about the fans? You know, because there's games going on, right? Fans come out. You have to continue to educate, you know, excuse me, educate the fans because if they're going to watch it on TV, they better understand it also. You know, back in 2008, uh, we didn't have this. And we didn't have social media platforms. So educating the fans was difficult because unless the game was on television or unless you were playing a lot of live events, how would you educate fans? So you're educating coaches and you're educating players. Today, we have social media platforms uh, on Tencent and TikTok, and we have programs, uh, Baseball 101, and then we come out with Baseball 102, and we have these characters and they play in, 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 in between innings of a game, these little commercials would come on. So we're educating people that way. We can do videos and we can put them out on, uh, we, can run, we can put videos on social media platforms and it might just be something simple on how to catch the ball and frame the ball or some other nuance about baseball, running the bases or you know, uh, how to turn a double play. But you can educate fans on social media. In 2008, if we weren't looking at them directly, it was very difficult to educate fans. Hey, Rick, um, you know, we, we all know this. It's common all over the world and everybody understands it. Hopefully that more countries are working on it. Coaches development is so important because you want the coaches in that country to continue to educate their kids because they're going to be with them all the time. And Major League Baseball obviously is doing a lot of work in that. You know, what was it that first time in China? You know, what were the obstacles like? When you started introducing a coaching program, um, what did you have to overcome doing that? The first time we did it, I, I got on the ground in 2007 in July, and I ran three coach education programs, one in Guangzhou, one in Shanghai, and one in Beijing. And in each one of those courses, we had 144 sports uh, college students from sports schools, one in Guangzhou. So, you know, that added up to 400 or whatever it was numbers. You do the math on that. And they were five-day sessions. They were nine hours a day. They were extremely intense. They were academic. They were field work. Uh, and our partner at the time uh, had helped, you know, uh, get us arranged with all of those, uh, with, with all of that. And uh, I will tell you, it was almost comical uh, that the most difficult thing, there were two things. Uh, the, the most difficult thing was that people had to learn that you had to tag up on a fly ball. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is they had to be able to understand when there was a force play and when it was a tag play. Because if you don't know how to play, if you don't tag up on fly balls, then the game becomes a travesty. 
every time the ball gets hit, everybody just takes off running, and then you end up getting a double play or a triple play. And then the other was understanding to tag the runner or to tag the base, because you could never tag. If you're going to tag the runner every time, you'll never turn double play. Mm -hmm. Two things. Uh, we would start on Monday, and then by the end of the day, Wednesday, you know, we finally would start to see that sinking in a little bit. But that was the two hardest things because they didn't play the game, and the game was moving extremely quick. So whenever we would play some fun and game versions of baseball to get them in the mechanics of running the bases and hitting and throwing, that was very tough. And the two words that I found that I needed to learn in Chinese before – I could teach anything was the word woda and nida, mine and yours. Because if you don't say mine and yours when the ball is hit in the air, you're on a collision course. And those were the first, the very first day, the very first time I worked on, walked on a field, I started to teach. The first thing I had to ask my interpreter was, how do you say mine and how do you say yours in Chinese? Woda, mine and nida is yours. Well, so I need a you get out there. Uh, you know, you kind of learn as you're going on. But uh, some of the most simplest things are some of the most difficult three strikes and you're out. That's easy. Yeah, but you're tagging up on a fly ball. And you know, everybody's off the races. So actually, a good defensive mood was, you know, they hit somebody hit two ground balls, and just hang on to the ball and then wait for somebody to hit a pop up. And then you'd get a triple play in the inning with the <laughs> so, uh, again, you're people, you're talking about people that don't know any more about baseball than I know about cricket. Absolutely. So, and it'd be like introducing cricket in the U S no doubt about yeah. it. We've got to start from the, the beginning, you know, Very coaching, beginning. coaching is so important. What's interesting, what you said with, uh, it seems like a lot of the coaches are from universities. Uh, who, so who are the most of the coaches with the young kids, most of the university people that have graduated, got an education, going through courses. Yeah, you know what's happening now? Uh, many of the, uh, what's happening economically. So let me give you this example. In 2007, if I would have said to a Chinese parent, I'll teach your son how to pitch this weekend for 200 RMB. Now, I don't do any of this. This is hypothetical. Mm -hmm. They would probably say, why should we pay you for that? If I told the same parents today, I want to teach your son pitching on the weekend for 2,000 RMB, they would say, how many weekends can you do it? Wow. So there's been a transition in the thought process of the student athlete overall. The, the country's policies have changed. They're, they have this double reduction policy now where instead of taking extra math classes in the afternoons after class, uh, they're doing, the schools are offering sports. Uh, so that's been a big change. As a result, a lot of the ex-professional players, a lot of the ex-college players, almost all of our graduates, there's a lot of opportunity and private clubs are growing all the time. That's the biggest growth is youth private clubs being run by people like you or people like me who have daughters or sons and they want to provide a platform for them to play. But what they need is a coach. So a lot of these ex-college players, even though college baseball is nowhere on the level it is in the States, they understand baseball to an extent. The ex-pro players, this is a great opportunity in our ex-graduates from our development centers. Uh, and, you know, also for international coaches to come in from time to time. So that has really grown the game. And uh, there's a lot of people now coaching the game and there's a huge need for more coaches, and which really helps the market. Absolutely. That's how you grow the game. When you're teaching all of those people in Guangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing, they're learning the game. They're loving it. They're falling in love with it. But at the end of the day, they go, okay, now what do I do with this? Right. Well, there's a lot to do with this. They can, they can make a very good living teaching club teams. So we're basically saying that they're starting club teams, academies, um, you know, charging, obviously, you know, to run it like a business and explain a little bit how the competition works, because how do the clubs play each other? Is it organized for one central system or is it like, you know, the Wild West? 
Well, you, you know, the, the CBA, the Chinese Baseball Association, of course, has their organization. They have their, their province games and they have their national tournaments. And that's been in place for decades. Uh, they're doing more with youth development and promoting it. But on the private levels, again, it's a guy like you and you have a private club and you call them the Bears. And, you know, one of somebody else in your hometown, when they have a club and then you play them in, in games or you'll organize tournaments and get these other clubs there. We're doing a lot of that youth development. So we have two programs that we're doing globally, uh, MLB is. And the one is called First Pitch. And that's exactly what it is, says it is. It's your first pitch. We're introducing baseball to boys and girls, putting a bat and a ball and a glove in their hand who have never experienced the game. We're going into schools and doing that. And uh, I mean, last year we did not, in spite the COVID year, last year we did 96 schools. Wow. Uh, then our MLB Cup, uh, which goes from uh, U6 to uh, U12, uh, I believe we did over 20 cities last year. 385 teams were involved in that. And we're running these tournaments in these cities to give them a platform to play. Because mm -hmm. the big challenge is, is that the clubs are doing training, and that's a lot more training than games. And then the first pitch, of course, is the introduction. But we need a, 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 a filler between the introduction to baseball and the elite development. And the MLB Cup fills that void on our development pyramid. Uh, and so we're, they're playing a lot more games because of that. Rick, that first pitch, uh, critical because, you know, that's that first time that player or young kid sees baseball. Um, and a lot of countries are always looking for, you know, better ways to introduce a game into a school. What's that first pitch look like? Well, we have a curriculum. I was fortunate to work with uh, several people out of our London office and design a curriculum, uh, design a, a kit, uh, design a, and we're working on expanding that curriculum and program now. So basically, we go into a school. Our coaches go in. They take a couple of classes. They, the school provides us with people who are going to be activators. That means they're going to run the program after we leave. Uh, we do some uh, taster sessions, as we call them. And then we leave behind some equipment. When I say equipment, I'm talking about foam balls and plastic bats because mm -hmm. we're out young boys and girls, and we're introducing a game that we need to be safe, a batting tee, some bases, some kind of cool, fun stuff. And then uh, if the schools are interested in that, then we have an entire curriculum that goes for eight weeks that these activators can come out, the activators can take those cards and say, this is the game that we're going to play today. And then there's more uh, outside of those sessions. There's a championship series. Uh, there's other programs in that that they can have a, a, a baseball festival if they want to bring in outside people and you know do a three ring type of uh, activity circus. It's kind of cool. So that's what that's all about. So we're leaving the equipment, we're giving them the instruction and we're leaving behind valuable uh, curriculum guides that are translated into their language and that are made to be attractive. It's not just black and white text. You know, we have illustrations and characters and comics, and uh, it's very cool. Yeah, it's, and it, those are great points, because it's got to be relatable to kids. It's got to be fun, right? you got to make it entertaining for the kids so they want to join. What's the competition? Because, you know, as you know, in the U.S., you know, you can introduce baseball, but now we got a lot of other sports that have a lot more action, that are a lot more fun. If a kid in baseball is not producing, doing well, you know, himself or herself, they're going to find something else to do. What's the competition in China? Very good point. And China is very unique in the way that things are evolving. But uh, as I said before, the government has really supported sports in recent, in the last year or two. And as I mentioned, there's an opportunity, a business opportunity for individuals to run their own clubs, to run mm -hmm. teams, to coach. Well, that's not just happening in baseball, that's happening in soccer, that's happening in, in basketball also. And, uh, and in some other sports. So I guess there's competition there. Uh, we really don't worry about that. You know, we just try to do the best we can and bring the game in and get people in love with it and have a fun experience. Uh, uh, but yeah, there's, I mean, if you go to clubs, they're, 
they're going out and getting kids that are three years old. They're getting wow. into four and five year old market and training and, you know, doing very, you know, basic things with them. And a lot of it involves just, you know, fitness and goofing around. It's kind of really cool to watch. They do a pretty good job. Uh, but yeah, there is some competition, but I, China's a big place and I really don't look at it as competition. You know, I, I think the com competition in my mind is us competing against ourselves to continue to do a better job. That's the Absolutely. I think of. Absolutely. You know, and I love the part that, you know, even the Chinese, everybody can be creative and, and figure out ways for young kids to play the game and to make sure that they stay in the game a long time. You know, I'm sure most of the listeners know the end goal eventually, just like basketball, you know, if a, if a major, if a player makes it to the big leagues and you've got incredible numbers here with college professional players, uh, kids playing professional baseball in the States, what, give us a, num a number, give us an idea number wise, how many baseball softball players are in the whole country? You got, you got any idea on that? You know, I used to up until 2015, I had this crazy meticulous chart of every player, every, the amount of players, teams, locations up until 2015. But it's very difficult to track now because not only has the game expanded and it just absolutely exploded. Mm. Also, many of those players play back then. They didn't, but some of them may play pony baseball. Some of them may play for the MP Cup. Some of them may be playing for their school teams. So you might have one player who plays in, in three different organizations. So it's difficult to track. But I know that uh, in, in my layman's uh, statistics, the amount of clubs since 2018 have grown by 228%. Wow. And the uh, amount of baseball facilities in the country have grown by 95%. And I do have a list of every single baseball facility in China, and I keep it updated. But I'm sure in the near future, I'll, that'll become a futile attempt too, because it'll just, it'll just explode. But I do have a very accurate account of that. And uh, it's grown by 95% in just uh, since 2018. And one, Go ahead. one of the, the areas that has really grown is <laughs> rooftop baseball fields and indoor facilities. So they're utilizing in the middle of a city, the rooftop of a school, the rooftop wow. of, and making a mini baseball field there because there's no land. It's like being in New York City, where are you going to expand? Wow. So really cool miniature rooftop baseball fields. And there are also uh, a lot of indoor facilities. And the, they represent two things. I really like this because they are footprints that something happened here recently. You know, you see a baseball field, you don't know when anybody's used it last. But if there's a rooftop baseball facility, you can guarantee somebody probably was there yesterday and probably early this morning. And with the indoor facilities that have really exploded, they involve entertainment, they involve social life. Uh, so they're not just batting cages, but there's entertainment, there's food. So it becomes, a healthy lifestyle, a baseball has now recognized as a healthy lifestyle. You can play baseball, you can have food, and you can have, you know, uh, entertainment at the same time. So those are really cool uh, to me, uh, barometers of how the game has grown. There's a first, rooftop baseball, man, and I hope they rooftop got great fans. Baseball fields, I hope they got perfect. They, they put down the baselines. They make it as complete as they can, depending on the size of the rooftop. And then they cover it with netting. And if you get, of course, if you get four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds in there, it's really cool. But, you know, you could get elite players training there too. But they're right in the middle of the city and you take the elevator up to the top floor and then you walk up a flight of stairs and it could be on top of a mall, could be on top of a business complex. Could be on top of a school very cool love it love it of space yes absolutely love it see there's always something we're picking up on the show we love it rick that was fantastic you know um you mentioned health it seems like nutritional wise the chinese are pretty healthy um you know there's the health part then there's also the mental part because of the game of baseball you know you know you're gonna fail there's gonna be times to fail 
how are the Chinese dealing with that when, you know, and how do you teach, you know, deal with the failure aspect of it? Because obviously it's a big part anywhere in the world. How, how are the Chinese handling that? Well, the people that we have, um, I think a lot of it has to do with your reaction. It's just like being a college coach. How do my college players handle failing? All depends on my perception and how I want to set the tone after that game. And there's times that, you know, you, you know, you hurt like the kids do and you understand that we just didn't do well today and it had nothing to do with effort. So I think that's exactly how we coach our players and we let them know just because you lost, it doesn't mean that we didn't have a game today. And the one thing that I do in game development and I believe is a mistake that a lot of organizations do when they're talking about game development is they worry about winning and losing. I worry about a healthy environment and individual improvement of our players. So in the last inning with a runner at first and we're up by one run, we may not be throwing our best pitcher to come in and, and close that game. We may bring in a kid that needs to get that experience and be in that environment. So we may lose that game, but we gain because now he's had, he's been there. He's done that. So our players, our student athletes, I never comment to our coaches about winning or losing, whether it's good or it's bad. I, I look at and see that we're doing healthy individual game development. And uh, I think that creates a positive environment. Man, I love that point. I hope we, we're going to repeat that point two, three times on the show um, and all over social media. That's a great point. Out there uh, from various countries around the world, you said you have 100 countries. I will tell you one of the things that I like to do I like to send several individuals to be host family, maybe in the United States or in, in an environment where in Australia, where they kind of mainstream into a baseball team. Because a lot of times when you take a whole team and you go away for three weeks or a month, the intention is to win. Right. Trying to develop. So then of the 25 players that you take, instinctively coaches are going to play 13 of them all the time. And then you have eight pitchers, 10 pitchers, and six of them get the bulk of all the work. So if you break that up and send three kids to the United States and they play on a club team for a month, they're getting more work in sometimes than they would have if they went with their whole team. So we've done that with programs uh, that, are, that are run by various organizations in Arizona, have done it in New Jersey, have done it in Australia. So for people out there listening, if you really want to develop, get some reputable baseball organizations and break your kids up and let them go play. That develops them socially, culturally, and also now they're playing. Whereas that kid might have been your number eight pitcher and you know he's going to get four innings in in three weeks instead of getting 14 innings in three weeks. Yeah, again, another great point. Love it. These are just great golden nuggets. Um, listen, the other part of all this, uh, you see it in the US, I don't know how it is in China now, at a certain point, certain players, if they're not doing well, or even if they just find something else new to do around that 13, 14 year old age, they start dropping out in the US, they don't continue. That's one of the goals to try to keep kids long-term, right? And these are two things that you brought up that keeps them long-term, because we're always focused on the top players and we're not, you know, we don't worry about as much, the, just the average. And, and plus, we don't know that 13 year olds average at 18 could be really good. And we're all of a sudden, we're losing that player. How about in China? The, the, the kids all of a sudden start leaving the sport because of the same reasons? Well, in China, because of the academic, the priority on academics, you know, kids play uh, on uh, sports in school uh, up through primary school, which is the sixth grade. Except in high primary school only goes to the fifth grade, but in general, up to the sixth grade. So as they get into middle school, the emphasis on academics and the requirements become a lot harder on them. So many of the kids who played baseball will ease off of it and maybe dabble in it a little bit. Some kids will drop it and they'll really focus on their academics. Of course, in our development centers, once we're committed to a kid, as long as he, as he participates and uh, is making the effort to be the best student and the best player he can, we retain him regardless. And of course, you have to do a good job recruiting, you know, 
Uh, but our kids don't leave, they stay with us. But in China, that traditionally, uh, there isn't much of a platform uh, for kids to play sports as they get into middle school and high school. Uh, I think that's going to change and it is changing. Uh, and with the government, uh, with the double reduction policy, that's gonna help because now kids can't be going and getting extra English and extra math classes and science uh, after they leave school. So the, the schools are promoting doing all kinds of sports activities on the campus. So a kid might get out of school at 3.30, but maybe they'll have sports activities a couple of days a week until six o'clock. Something similar to that. Whereas before they left at 3.30 and then they probably go on to something else. All right, you're also, you're educating coaches, you're, you're educating players, you know, you got the academies and I'm talking about the MLB program now. Um, you know, how do you balance, uh, speak to our audience on this because how do you balance practice and number of games and depending on the age and on top of that the coach also has to learn things in game so they got to be have some game experience also because that's not easy to 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 control a game or to work a game let's call it um how do you how do you work with that well you know we're a year-round program we probably use bats and balls from about march the first uh middle of march until the middle of november uh, we probably play an average of 60 to 80 games a year. And that's not, you know, that's pretty balanced out over that eight month, nine month period. Uh, and then we stop in the fall and, and we're, you know, we play, we do some interesting all, we play flag football, we play basketball, we have our own basketball league. Uh, we do hip hop dancing, we do yoga. You know, we do try to do really cool stuff with the kids. You know, of course yeah. we're getting in doing all the serious stuff too. But we're doing other activities just like you and I did growing up that mm -hmm. are off that make them better. Uh, but, you know, that's what we're kind of doing. And, and I guess, you know, in China, I don't think that the outside of our DCs, our development circle, I don't think they're at a point where they're worried about playing too many games. It's in the other direction. You know, in the United States, I, I talk to people that, you know, you got kids that are playing 160, 200 games a year. Uh, with travel teams and i'm not going to comment on that here negatively or positively but we don't have that problem and our kids play a very aggressive schedule of 60 to 80 games over the course of a year and that's probably a pretty healthy number uh, our older kids probably play more closer to 80 and our younger kids play about 60. but the average kid outside of our circle is probably playing a fraction of those games because I guess, yes People play tournaments. Right. And I'm guessing if you look at the number of games, if you were to count the number of practices, I'm just guessing off the top of my head, it'd be double that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, we, you know, with our MLB program and our coaches, I mean, we're not trying to, we're not worried about the, the, the quantity of how much we do. We're mm -hmm. looking at the quality and the balance. So, you know, our kids train in the afternoon. They, I mean, our typical schedule is Monday and Tuesday, they're off from baseball. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, they probably have a two and a half hour baseball session like a normal high school would. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, they're either going to play games or they might have double sessions or the coach might give them off on Sunday afternoon for other things. So we, we really have a lot of balance and we have our holidays. Uh, and we keep in mind that our kids are in a year round program. So it's not like we only have them for three months. We got to get better. You know, we have quite a bit of time to do that, watch them grow and evaluate them. Folks, we got a few more minutes, and Rick has been fantastic uh, for, with his time here. And we really like it. And I know you got a lot of work to do. And the, uh, it, earlier you mentioned, you know, the Chinese and the Asian in general are pretty disciplined, pretty focused, um, work hard, all those things. And then all of a sudden you mentioned hip hop and all these other things that you introduced, you know, in your training. What was it like when you first had that, you know, I want to say introduce fun things, you know, movement and action and all that stuff. What was that like and how is it going now? I mean, they get, they get accustomed to it now. Well, in 2008, you didn't introduce hip hop to anybody in China. Yeah. <laughs> From China. There was no skateboards. There was no hip -hop. There was none of those types of things that you have today. There was no TikTok. There was no social media. Uh, 
So just having fun and games was maybe playing some variation of baseball, you know, uh, that wasn't real baseball and just having a playing two ball, you know, or, or just having a fun and game type of an activity uh, was kind of cutting edge. Where today, I mean, we're doing things that, that the Chinese socially, culturally are doing, you know, where kids, they see hip hop, you know, the Koreans have really started that trend, the K-pop, and mm -hmm. he's embraced it to Taiwanese and, and so have the Chinese. So doing hip hop dancing is a great way to get people interested in the game because only 20% of all people participate in sports and probably ever will. So how do you get those other percentage of the people to get attracted to your sport? Well, you get celebrities to wear your uniforms. You do, you sell cool. So if mm -hmm. our are doing hip hop and we're getting that on social media, people who don't play baseball say those guys look cool. And what about if we have a college tournament and in between games of a double header, we have a hip hop dance contest with the two best players from each college team and our kids. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting that on social media, and these really good-looking, handsome guys in uniforms are doing hip-hop dancing, and, you know, it's promoting the game. You're making yourself look attractive. So that's kind of my ideas on that, and it's also a good health and fitness. Go ahead and do 20 minutes of hip-hop dancing. Let me know how you feel after that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, yeah. uh, and it, interesting enough, um, when we're talking about all these things, you know, think about, I'm thinking about this, the Chinese have a lot to look forward to. I mean, we're talking about the ability to become a player, a coach, a run your own academy, run your own program, play internationally, play in college, professional, all this. I mean, there's, so there's a, there's a lot of goals that these kids now see in front of them. The other part we didn't mention, and I'd like to finish off with that. And one more question on coaches that is, we didn't talk about the national team. I mean, we got national teams in China now that are competing worldwide. How does yeah. that process work? How do they pick these players? It's a big country. Yeah, and I was going to add to your list right there that the other opportunities are to play in the CNDL, the Chinese National Baseball League. Oh. Uh, opportunity. There's top opportunities to play for your province team. Mm -hmm. and your province team, there's opportunities to play for your national team. So usually, they're going to look at the players in the CNDL just like we have the MLB all-star team and mm -hmm. best players and, and put them in that program. And they'll use players out of our program. We've had 34 of our players participate with team China on various levels, the senior team, uh, all the way down to the, the U 16 team, U 12. Uh, in fact, the starting second baseman uh, and the starting catcher for the last couple of years, are our DC, our former DC players, and we have some pitchers that have thrown for them too. But we've had a lot of players that have played for them in the World Baseball Classic too. And I think the selection process is same as it is here in the States. You know, you, you watch players play, you get feedback from coaches, uh, and you have a camp, you run that camp, you get to see them up close and personal, and then you make some decisions on that. Yeah, it's very similar. And on coaches, um, things that you're working on, you know, as they get into, you know, coaching kids and coaching games, are there some areas they that you're really trying to focus them on to help them out a little bit more because it's a little bit more difficult? Well, I think what we've done in the past when we've had Jim LaFever and, and Terry Collins, uh, John McLaren, and I might be missing somebody. Bruce Hurst has worked with us. Uh, Antavero has worked with us. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be unfair and not mention everybody. I think you're... you're constantly having them work side by side and, and whether you're handling a pitching staff and the amount of pitches that they throw and pitch counts or how much work or what kind of training they get in between starts, uh, how you run your game, uh, when you bunt and when you don't. Uh, I think our coaches uh, do a really good job of mentoring uh, the local coaches, the domestic coaches on how that approach should be. You know, you guys have had, a, and I'll end it with this, Rick, and you can add anything else at the end you like. Um, you know, you've had a great advantage because you've gotten into the grassroots of Chinese baseball. You've helped it develop early on. I know they were playing for a while, but you helped develop it. You know, talk to some countries out there. There's a lot of countries out there. You know, in the U.S., we have a lot of things going on. It's hard to make changes sometimes, you know, because 
you know, everybody's doing their own thing in some ways. Some countries have the benefit of starting and learning from other countries, so they're not making the same mistakes in a lot of ways. Talk to countries around the world. What's really important if you're developing the game of baseball, some of the key areas to really focus on? Yeah, let me talk about a few things. Number one is to have fun. Because you and I and everybody listening, the reason we go fishing is because it's <laughs> so we didn't have a professional fishing coach. Right. <laughs> in the club. We fish because it's fun. And when we catch fish, it's fun. And nobody criticizes us. So make the game fun for them if you're going to attract kids to the game. Otherwise, they're going to go play soccer, football, or they're going to go play basketball. Uh, so I think that that is the, is the number one thing uh, that they need to know. The other thing I think that is so important, and I'll give you my own example, and I'll be honest, and I think this is a big statement coming from somebody in my position who's been a professionally working in the game for 42 years is that two things. I don't, would not teach the game the way I did for 27 years at the College of New Jersey if I got back on the field in a uniform. In the last 15 years, I've learned a lot from MLB. And I would do some things differently. I would do some things the same. I would do some things differently. And if I got back on the game in the United States on the field, I would need to spend one year re-educating myself to learn everything that's going on. And so I'm saying that in my position, I think that educating yourself and having an open mind is important. And if you're in a country where baseball is not, or in a venue where baseball is not the top sport, if you can expose yourself to international ideas, you're going to learn a lot. And uh, because a lot of times what happens, I see internationally, it's the very closed circle in a very small area location where they're playing baseball. And the game that you're playing isn't really the game that is being played on the highest levels. And it's very difficult to communicate that to somebody because they're having success locally. Mm -hmm and they don't understand why you would need to change. And, you know, I, I've had a player tell me recently, not in China, in another country, that when he hits and he plays on the top level, he only waits and swings at outside pitches because he gets two outside pitches every time he bats and he hits all his hits to right field. Well, if you played in another baseball culture, after one game, everybody would chart you and they would just bust you inside with 91, 92 when you're seeing 71, 72 and wait for it to be on the outside corner and you couldn't survive. It's very difficult to explain that to somebody because they don't need to change. They just wait for the outside pitch and flare it to right field. But try to get yourself exposed, you know, and I think it would be the same thing that when I was 16 years old and I played soccer in the States, had I gone to Germany and played for six weeks in the summer, that would have totally changed me as a soccer player. How I play the game, how I wear my uniform, how I think the game and my technique would have totally changed because I would have seen the game played at 16 years old on a higher level with a broader scope of how you play this game. So get yourself out there and get exposed. And for some people, that's easy. So for some people, that's not. What I will tell you with my experience, open your mind, because this game is changing all the time. The basics are the basics, but it's always changing. And there's always stuff to learn. Like I said, I went to a, in Sri Lanka, and there's this guy with a bamboo stick over his shoulder, you know, teaching pitching. And if I could learn something from that, there's a lot to learn and, and there's really a lot of good teachers and stuff on the internet that you can learn from. Yeah, and folks nowadays, and, and Rick, you know this, nowadays you can learn from everybody. You know, everybody's putting stuff on the internet and, it, and they're doing it from all over the world and they're developing new ideas. So there's no excuse that you can't learn from all over the world and you can do it online a lot of times. It doesn't cost you as much because I know there's a lot of factors when it comes to, you know, cost. Hey, uh, buddy, uh, you've been great, man. This has been fantastic. I cannot thank you enough for being on the show. 
Yeah, well, thank you. It's fun. I'm looking forward to it. And I know we tried to connect a while ago and that didn't happen, but I'm really glad we connected today. And uh, I enjoy talking and uh, it's really good to talk baseball. Well, and we need to do it more because you, you, you got a lot of insight in, in places around the world. There's a lot more education. Now we're doesn't give it enough justice, but we will have another show. And maybe it might be, you know, um, you know, in a couple of weeks, depending on your schedule. But let's see how things go out, because I think a second show would be fantastic. I'd like to also to offer anybody out there internationally, in particular, that would like to reach out to me. I'd, I'd be willing to. Uh, you know, if they're looking for advice or you want to ask questions or discuss something, uh, I enjoy that. And we can put, if you, if, with your, if you want, we can put your email on our show notes um, so mm -hmm. people can contact you. Or just let me know after the show how you want that done, and we will put it out there on the, uh, ba you know, Baseball Outside the Box um, mm -hmm. website. Okay, good. All right, man, listen, I wish you the best 2020. I also want to make sure, you know, travel safe, stay healthy. Um, I hope they stay in touch. Keep up the great work because I think, you know, we need to keep doing this worldwide, helping coaches and players the best way we can. Uh, safe travels back to uh, China. Thank you, Pete. See you, see you too. Also, stay safe. All right, folks, that is Rick Dell. What a great show, General Manager of Baseball Development Asia with MLB. And I want to thank MLB for allowing Rick to be on the show. They are doing a great job in the U.S. and around the world developing players and coaches. So keep doing that. And Special thanks to Brian Crock, our producer with the Line of Media Group. Special thanks to everybody in the U.S. and around the world. Don't forget to keep sharing the show. And finally, stay healthy, be safe. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next show.